Welcome to One Thought at a Time, where we get curious about what makes us tick. I'm Lara Small, and joining me today is Ian Travers. Hello. Hello. This feels very strange. I bet it does. <laughs> yes. I bet it does. So the this is your 50th episode, mm. and we're marking the 50th by you being interviewed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, thank you for... For st- sitting where I normally sit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. and I'm sure the reasons for that will come out as we go but yeah it's great um it's um it does feel very odd to be on this side of it but uh yeah let's I'm excited to see where this goes today okay let's see what happens okay so you subject us all to a variety of questions uh so I get to return the favor Ian what do you do with your time so what do I do with my time I spend most of my time helping people get out of their own way. Oh, okay. Uh, so how do I do that? I guess I have two main avenues. Obviously, I, I have a I have a business I run. Uh, that some people will know I run a. I started a company called Thinking It Better, um, where we focus on mindset, but get involved in all sorts of things from project management, business strategy, all that kind of thing centered around behaviour. So thinking it better. Uh, and I founded that in December 2012. Um, I also, as of 50 episodes two years ago, um, in February 22, started One Thought at a Time, the podcast, which mm-hmm. is what we're doing now, um, which which isn't a money-making thing, um, but it's, it's part of a passion, um, which for me was how... How could we find a way to help people know some of the stuff that I know now and some of my guests have known, which might just help someone get out of their own way? So it's about, you know, I I spend my time helping people get out of their own way. Okay, it's it's actually a great tagline and (laughs) statement (laughs) when I update on that podcast. So the, I guess we could just briefly cover how we originally connected. Um, we're both very proud to work for a big old blue chip company, big engineering company. Yes. And uh, I was set up to be uh, corporately trained on a spreadsheet, which was my preconception to mm-hmm. the course. And what actually happened is that on this two day kind of training course, I got to meet you, Ian. And mm-hmm. instead of a, I think I'll call it the jug and cup method, which is mandrolic orchestration through you will do this and operate the spreadsheet in this way I ended up connecting with you on a a level where actually you wanted to understand why we were using this process but then also you, you then unlocked the kind of why we think like we do in a way and yeah. And I felt like there was more to than just this is a training course. This is more of a I've met you as a person and, and how passionate you were about how we think mm. and how we operate and yeah. the cause of our actions um, and, and what 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 an, an eventuality might lead to. But actually, the understanding of what got us there in the first place. Yeah. And and that's where you mentioned about thinking it better and one thought at a time. I was like. Ah, oh, this is not just a training course. I've understood. I've left knowing a little bit more about me as a result of the time spent. <laughs> that's really good. That that yeah. I mean, and that always makes me happy when I when I hear that as well. Um, and yes, I I do remember that uh, meeting there as well. And it's always my my hope that when I do deliver any kind of event. So that was you know that was very much a, a role specific training thing. Mm. I always think there's a place for us to understand the role that what we think about plays. So many people have said so much about this, have, you know, discovering our why. Um, you know, Simon yeah. Sinek, you know, yes. wrote a book about it. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's really important. And just to say to people, you will comply, you will do this because I've told you so, it's never worked. Yeah. In history, it's never worked. Um, doesn't work as a parent, doesn't work as a police officer. You know, we were always taught, even in the police, personal is better than tell. I'd like to corroborate that ever so slightly because Mm. the kind of you will comply takes me back to some of my military training Mm. where, but then you realise the initial you will do this is actually for protection of the why. 
Yes. And so you you are going to go down to your belt buckle and you're going to crawl in mud um, yep. through this extended period of time. This is disgusting. Why are we doing this? Oh, because there's shots firing over your head. That's yeah, that's the why. Why? Yeah. And this is why what we need to do to keep infantry safe. Yes. And so you're going to get pushed beyond your comfort zone and I'm going to tell you and direct you to do that. But it's fundamentally to keep you and your fellow peers safe. So I, th- I think that's, a, that, that's a, a valid qualification there really because... Sometimes we don't know what's best for us. Right, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we need someone to help us through something which might be particularly uncomfortable yeah. in order for us to be better for it. Um, like going to school. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm sure that... And I can't remember what was going through my head when I was eight or nine <laughs> but I'm sure if I was given the option yeah, would you like to go to school today or would you like to do something else I'm sure probably the something else would have been mm-hmm. but we do that don't we we go through that because it it, it does condition us in, yes. in a certain way and it gives us some foundations that we can then build on mm. hopefully later on but then arguably we've, we're kind of steering into when we challenge our why as a result of that institutionalization so we we tap into you go to school and then you may choose to go to university or do an apprenticeship and then you need to go and get your job and you need to go and get chartered so there's almost like we we're conditioned to but there's the the initial why because we need the step up program because we need a syllabus in a way but then almost what you're turning on its head is is asking why realistically is it all about capitalism commercialism oh Oh, right so (laughs) right so now it starts um (laughs) so it's interesting um i had the good fortune to be uh interviewed on zoe mischief movements Mm. podcast and her opening question to me was what's my mischief and and it plays straight into this place because if there's one thing that i find um distasteful is probably too strong a word but this, the conditioning we, we have mm. is helpful to a point, but not beyond that. So, you know, go to school, do your exams, go to university, get a good degree, get a job, get a promotion, yeah. retire, die. Yeah. Um, not for me. Not for me. Uh, and in 50 episodes, 49 um, and before this one, I don't think anyone who's come on the podcast has ever followed that they've found a different route and that for me is where the real um the wake up call i think is is that you can just drift Mm -hmm. you can drift through this and 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 i'm if people are comfortable with that i have absolutely no problem with that at all but where someone has some potential has a dream the thing that i I really, really rubs me up the wrong way. And you know I'm a positive person from mm. the time we've spent. For people to put barriers in people's way and tell them you can't do that, you know, you do that. Who do you think you are? That's when I think we need to help people. Um, not to be difficult or grumpy or um, antagonistic, but just to think about why you're doing that. Is that right for you? Um, yeah, in a uh, way, you're kind of defending your principles and the kind of what you've been conditioned to believe. And yes. then when someone else does something different, yeah, it's not a personal offence to you, but you can you can come across like that. I, I uh, you know, back at back at school, I, knowing what I know now, there's probably seeds that were sown back at school mm. which have driven what I do now. Um, I was subject to, I think, to some injustices at school where I was picked on. I mean, I, I wasn't um, I wasn't the hip kid. I wasn't the sporty kid. I wasn't the I was um, pigeonholed as the the brain box um, was bullied. Um, yeah, I, I didn't enjoy my school time very much at all. Um, and on a couple of occasions where I did decide to stand up for myself, mm. uh, I got punished for that. Um, and. Uh, and she's probably dead now, but my head of house um, at my comprehensive school put me in detention for standing up to what I thought was a class bully. Um, and 
As Maya Angelou famously said, you'll forget what people say and do, but you'll always remember how they made you feel. And that is so true. And that, I think, was the very... That was the, the early founder of Thinking It Better there that thought, that's not right. That's not right. Thanks for sharing that one, Ian. The, with uh, Thinking It Better, you have to start from perhaps thinking it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you've touched on uh, your, your school background, mm. but could you just add some more detail Almost like this, where did, was it school and uni and job for you? And is this why we're challenging the difference? But mm. what's, the, what, what's the textbook step that you took that means we're challenging that status quo? So I fell into university. Okay. Uh, I went to university because I was told that it was what I should do. Mm. Now... It's a difficult one because going back to sometimes you have to do the stuff that maybe would seem unpleasant to better you. So there's a little bit of the why in there. So there's a little yep. bit of the why in there. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I was pushed that way. But let's be clear, I was pushed that way okay. because I didn't want to leave home. Um, I enjoyed being at home. Um, I didn't want to go and meet new people. Um I didn't like the picture I had in my head of what university was all about, um, which was completely wrong, by the way, which I'm sure we'll come back to. Most of the things we're afraid of are stories we tell ourselves, which are usually wrong. Mm. So that step, that automatic step of you, you thou shalt go to university. I was the first person in the entire of my family who has ever been to university. Um, so... Even that in itself made me feel uncomfortable because that means that oh that means you're you're going against the grain you know you're you're kind of bucking the trend you're the odd one out. Mm. Um, so going and doing that, and I didn't enjoy. It. I mean, I, I cannot t for the people who say your best years of your life are at school, they're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they really aren't. Um, they were challenging. Um, the elation of finishing school and knowing that I didn't have to go back. Finishing uni. Finishing school and then and finishing uni. uni okay. Um, was a re was a relief, you know, and I, I can't I can't wrap that up. I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't one of those who's suddenly going to go back and do a master's and then do a PhD. And I, d I wanted to get back to a life, uh, whatever that life was, and I wasn't sure what that was at the time. So, so the, these, I think, the school thing. The university thing, they were useful in that they've made me who I am today. Um, but if I had my time again, I probably wouldn't choose the same subjects. Okay. Um, if I, I know I wouldn't. Are but you then, okay to share what subjects you did? Yeah. So I, I, I've always been practical. So maths came easily to me. So um, that was kind of a no-brainer. You know, if I had to do A-levels, I would do the stuff that was part of least resistance. So I did I did two maths A-levels. Nice. At university, I fell into engineering. My, my, my dad was an engineer, not a professional engineer, whatever professional means. Yeah. Um, but my dad was a, was a great creator. Um, he was an inventor. He made amazing machines. Um, when I suffered from hay fever a lot as a kid, he made an amazing device that sat in the loft hatch. And it was a... What I know now to be some kind of air purification system. No he, we, yeah, so we invented stuff to make our lives better. So he was brilliant at that. He was a rubbish businessman. Um, but a, but a, but um, so that would have been the same at school. But at university, what I was really interested in is I'd started reading books by uh, Jung and Freud. Okay. And I started to read these books and I started to learn a bit more about me and why I was feeling and thinking the way I was. Ah. And this was quite fascinating to me. Um, there were lots of strange things going on at the time. And I, I don't mean strange peculiar. There were there were some bumps in the road family wise, um, which probably made me very, very keen to want to be at home. Yeah. Um, I, I lost my confidence to... Um, there was a point where I, I wanted to be sure that my parents would still be there when I got home, oh, wow. um, which, yeah, well, that, that was a difficult time. So, so I wasn't that person who wanted to to go and f um, sort of fly or flit. So this this fascination about how we behave there was it got me curious. 
And what I really wanted to do with that was to do more. But I didn't because why would why, why would you do psychology? You know, who do you think you are to do psychology? You know, that's you so know, interesting. Get a get a proper job. Probably, yeah. um, so I did engineering. <laughs> I almost feel like we could twist um, twist ourselves around because I was due to do psychology at 18, mm. travel eight into oh. uni. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm not doing, I don't know why, what I do with that degree. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I went to do engineering two years later. <laughs> So <laughs> you got travel aided into engineering and wanted to do psychology. Because <laughs> it's that. So, well, there you go. There, there's a couple of great examples where we kind of find ourselves at a place that we're not quite sure how we got there. And we're not even quite sure. I didn't really understand at that point, even if they were my decisions to make. I, sometimes they're not. Because we respect the elders around us. Yes. And we follow their, their guidance because we yeah. couldn't possibly... If you go against the status quo, then you're breaking the rules and you're you're not following procedure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and part of this, you know, part of this, there was this thing that I was the first to go to university. Mm-hmm. So I almost then had to succeed. Yes, so there's additional pressure on top of that. Yeah. What years were you at university, Ian? Uh, 1984 to 87. 84 right. to 87, yeah. Just, just some level of context. Yeah, yeah, 84 to 87. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you how I can time bound it. So my, the historians listening to this will, will, will check their facts. I went to the University of Sussex in Brighton. Um, and it, in the first autumn that I was there, someone decided to blow up the Grand Hotel on the seafront where the Conservative Party were holding their conference. So I spent the entire of my time at university, I remember seeing massive scaffolding covering a big hole in the front of the Grand Hotel. So This was the Thatcher? That was the Thatcher. Yeah, th- okay. yeah, so that would, I'm pretty sure that was 84, 85, something like that. So that's, um, and also while I was down there, BBC famously got a weather forecast wrong um, and lots of trees came down while I was at university <laughs> as well. <laughs> Oh, that would tie in with my youth because um, right. I slept all the way through it. But Jersey got particularly sabotaged by right. uh, that that wind, that, that that weather conditions. Yeah. <laughs> so there was so there was lots of stuff going on in the world. Um, oh, I think somewhere along that time, I think also we were told not to eat lamb because it would glow in the dark because Chernobyl had exploded as well. Oh, there we. So go. lots lots goes on, doesn't it? You okay, know. so that kind of dates the university age. Yeah, yeah. But then with um, uh, this degree, yeah. That led you into kind of falling, obviously landing up with an engineering job, I think. Where yes. Where did you go next? So, so where I went next, uh, another interesting one. Part of me had had a desire to experience um, military. So I got interested before I, before I went to university, I got interested at a younger age in the Air Training Corps um, and uh, went along um my dad took me and I was told I was too young and they wouldn't take me. So that kind of, that never reared its head again. Mm. At university, um, there was then uh, the milk round interviews uh, where the associations would come to the university and sort of try to sell their wares. And I got really interested in uh, REMI, okay. Royal Engineers. Well, Royal Electrical Mechanical, Mechanical Engineers. Engineers. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it came between, should I do that? Or should I go with this well-known <laughs> <laughs> big old engineering. engineering company? Yeah. So, so I ended up going um, with uh, with Rolls Royce, and they sponsored me for my final year, um, which is great because it meant I got money, mm. um, and that was good. Um, but there was that little thing there, and I did manage to scratch that itch later on. I spent ten years as a, a police constable, so I, I did do my service. Perfect, and that was what was important to so me. So, uni. Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce. For how many years, roughly? Um, so I did it in two bites. Um, yeah. I went as a grad trainee for probably three or four years, probably four years. Yeah. Um, then I did some other exciting stuff. Then I went back to Rolls-Royce and topped it up to 17 years at Rolls-Royce. Got it. Um, and was your special police constable service, is that a volunteer service? Mm. So you do that as a kind of a part-time yes. job? Yes, yeah. Um, a greatly misunderstood role. Mm. Um, special police constables were around before the regular police force. Oh, right. They came first. So uh, right back in the days of Robert Peel, um, the Peelers, um, 
specials were around first. They were an unpaid um, body, um, so paid came later. But a special police constable um, has been around forever. Um, they are f- have all the powers of a regular police officer, with one exception, and that is where a regular police officer maintains all their powers when they are off duty. A special police constable only has all the powers when they are signed on and on duty. But other than that, they are the same. Unlike um, anything like a, a PCSO, which we have around now, who... Police Community Support, support officer. officer. Yeah, um, who don't have the same number of powers. Um, it's completely different. So a special um, is a police officer. Um, and I did that for 10 years. Why did you do that, Ian? I have always had this thing that you have to contribute. Um, My my dad did his national service in the army. He didn't have any choice in doing that at the time. Um, But I think that instilled a little bit of a sense of community. Mm -hmm. I've done something for my country, for my community. And I feel that's right. Um, and even to this day, I'm still frustrated by this um, this disease of entitlement, which seems to be all over the place. In my mind, you have to give back first before you take. Um, so it was in my mind, it, it's it was me contributing and doing something, um, something of use. And it pushed me outside my comfort zone. Because I was the kid who got bullied at school and I was the person who was finding their feet at university. Okay. And suddenly I'd got the opportunity to put on a uniform and step out of my comfort zone. And kind of earn your stripes. Literally, then, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and then experience what it's like with the general public. Arguably, you kind of have a shield because of the uniform, mm. but you then get subjected to more abuse because of the uniform. Yeah, and you realise... <laughs> what I know now, which goes back to this, there is only so much command you have to influence. Mm. Um, So I became a self-defence instructor within the police as well, one of the first special constables in the country to be able to be qualified as a a self-defence instructor. And even then, we spent a lot of our time talking about conflict resolution model, which is how do you talk yourself out of a problem? Mm. Before you even get anywhere near raising a, a, a baton, CS spray or your fists, how do you talk yourself out of it? How do you reason? Um, so, yeah, um, so that was um, a- another curious thing, I suppose, that so I did the, the, the policing because I thought it pushed me out of my comfort zone and, and scratched an itch. Another thing which, again, all these things made no sense to me at the time, but bear in mind that I, I didn't feel overly confident at school, yet I found myself the front man in a band at school. (laughs) Now, when Ian puts the guitar on and stands in front of the microphone... And physical shield. um, And then sings and plays guitar in front of a a hall full of people, I got a buzz. Okay. I loved it. So there's an introvert-extrovert split there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, now that I'm more self-aware, um, I think a lot of people who know me would probably peg me as an extrovert. I'm really not. I'm, neither am I an introvert. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy to, to play the card when it, when it suits because I'm only confident to be extrovert in certain situations. Flextrovert then. <laughs> Flextrovert, like it. Let's use that. Yeah, but yeah, and uh, see, I didn't really understand it at the time. It, 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 you know, why? You know, I'm the, I'm this kid who is not popular and gets picked on at school. Yet suddenly, when I stand in front of a microphone and make noise that people like and clap and sing, th- there's there's something going on there. And then I sort of come off stage and I then put my school tie back on and mm. go back to back to normal. So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, and all of these, I think, were inevitably leading me to where I'm now. So that leads us to thinking it better. Mm. Did, did that evolve from, although I've missed a trick. So you said Rolls Royce and then something special. Yeah. <laughs> and then back to Rolls Royce. I'm curious about the something special bit. <laughs> so um, in between the two, 
uh, and again, this is this is the conform via versus not conform bit, and there is there is a theme brewing here. In that, I became a graduate trainee, and I went through the graduate training scheme, yeah. and I got this junior position. But yeah. hang on a minute, don't you know who I am? I'm 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 supposed to be a director of this business. What's I the mean, matter with you? I've been conditioned to believe this is the case. Yes, <laughs> and you're not moving fast enough for me. So do you know what? I'm pressing the eject seat, and I'm getting out of here. Okay. So I left Rolls Royce because I'd got offered a um, a position at a company in Leicester. Um where I could look after a, a whole factory. Okay. So I thought, too right. That's got my name all over it. So I went and I um, I did some manufacturing engineering, relaying it out of a factory, then got to run the factory, then got to run all the factories. Um, and this was me wearing my leadership hat for the first time. Yes, okay. And this is where... The Ian, who was the front man in the band, Mm -hmm. found his use. Because I found I could stand up in front of a a factory full of people and I could connect with them. And I could talk to people in a way that would cause them to respond. Um, And again, I didn't know that at the time. But what I I suppose was I, I was surprised at is that can not all managers or leaders do this then um we're as always happy um and if if there was ever an opportunity of um who'd like to speak first well that was me you know it was like they were saying ian this this microphone must be for you now um so yeah that that was another so i did that for a while then i started to get approached so i was i was approached while i was there to go and work for another company um, and that was a baptism by fire. Uh, I, I got I got asked to go and work for this company in Grantham um, called called Wordsworth Holdings. I don't think it's in existence anymore. Uh, run by this guy called Duncan Wordsworth, who also isn't with us anymore. Who was an asset stripper of the sort of eighties, nineties, and he was a complete. Uh, I can't think of the words to say, but a lot of people, even when I was at Rolls Royce, said, oh, they're a bit of a tyrant. I bl- tell you now, everyone at Rolls Royce was a pussycat compared to Duncan Wordsworth. He okay. was he was an awful person. Okay. But I learnt lots. Yep. Um, we he, sometimes we learn more from poor examples. Yes, <laughs> ex- exactly. Uh, and he, yeah, he was really awful to work for, and I, I, did, I didn't last there very long. I, I could not... I couldn't live like that. Uh, he, he, on one occasion, on my production line, um, pointed to someone down the production line and said, is he one of yours? I said, yes, he is. He says, go and give him a bollocking. And I kind of looked quizzically. I says, why? He's done nothing wrong. He says, does them good, keeps them on their toes. This is the guy, okay? Oh, wow. he, he went down. He screamed and bawled at this guy, came back to me with a big beaming smile on his face, said, you'll be doing that soon. Hmm. So I left. Okay. Um, so that was that. Then I found um, uh, this this little company in Nottinghamshire um, who were laser cutters, and I was part of the leadership team there, and we were we were running the whole thing. So that was a small, tiny business. So all of these were really, really great experiences because all I'd known was the big corporate world of yes. Rolls Royce, the yeah. big safe harbour, the big fluffy safe haven, which is uh, a large corporate. Um, so I learnt a lot. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of scars and a lot of learning from outside. And I think they all started to play into this. Okay, so front man in a band, um, happy to stand on a street corner in a police uniform and yep. deal with difficult people. Yep. Um, actually okay being bald at um, in the corporate world because actually who do you think you are? You you know, that's I, I have a vote. So there were lots of ingredients dropping in here mm. which were actually starting to say, it's all right to swim against the flow. Okay. It's actually okay. Uh, and that's a coat which I then started to wear comfortably. Because when I did then go back to Rolls Royce, yes, um, I did lots of roles there, uh, all sorts of different areas from purchasing to engine assembly to, to master scale, all, all sorts of stuff. But the theme there was I took teams, I brought teams together. They were happy teams. 
they were happy teams. Um, I, I like to work with happy people. And, and I think you have a responsibility as a leader to make your team happy. Now, mm. you know, before people get the idea that this is all about bringing cakes in and everyone laughing and <laughs> no, 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 it means people need to be treated fairly. And even in difficult times, if you've treated people right, then I think they become, by my definition, happy people. It doesn't mean they've got a smile on their face, but they feel protected, safe, able to do their role. Um, and that I just kept repeating. In different departments. In different departments. Yeah. And that's when it got me to reflect uh, a very good mentor I had at the time, who was also now dead. There's a pattern here. <laughs> <laughs> People um, do age, they do do this. <laughs> but, but they do. But the, the learning really was, it got me to reflect on, how do you do it? Because nobody had ever asked me that before. I'd never stopped to think, how do I do this? Mm. What's the process I use? Because I was using a process. I didn't know what that process was. And I now know it to be my process. That's how I operate. Um, and that really was the thing that made me think, I think there's, I think there's some mileage in this. Um, I'd met a guy, again, who I've, uh, you know, big influences on my life, um, a guy called Michael Finnegan. I met many, many years ago. And he'd uh, coached the likes of... Um, I think David Moyes, I think he'd coached. Um, the Jimmy White, the snooker player, he'd, he'd, he'd coached. And uh, he came and did some work in um, in, in Rolls-Royce, brought in by a, um, um, a, a leader I worked for at the time, a guy called Trevor Allman, again, who I, who I have a lot, a lot of time for. And I, I met Mike. And, and Mike, again, challenged my thinking. Um, but he was talking to me about the brain and the mind. and And it was the first time that I'd had that since reading those books by Frank, Jung and Freud in the sixth form common room yes. some 15 or 20 years before. So that was the, that was the moment where Thinking It Better was, was born, again, some years later, but 2012 Thinking It Better was born. And I've then tried to live up to that learning. Yeah, and I wanted to lead to the impact of that because um, you, there's, there's challenge the status quo and and doing something different independently and yeah. then there's doing it with the kind of the the criticalness of looking after your family whilst you're doing it mm. which some people may find uh cha very challenging to do because if as a as a parent or a co-parent co you've got to figure out how breadwinning maintains <laughs> oh so it's, it's a really good point actually really because a lot of people make assumptions mm -hmm. so when i left rolls royce in december 2010 um, and, I, you know, a lot of good good friends and colleagues who have, have left since. Um, and I know it's it's no secret that, that Rolls-Royce, um, you know, do do offer people money to to leave, mm. as any large corporate does. Um, not for me, they didn't. Um, um, now, why that is, I think it's an important thing to understand, is to step off a dare i call it safe oh it's job safe. it's you know. I, I call it um the golden handcuffs yeah because i mean i'm immensely immensely privileged to work there i'm really infinitely mm. proud of what we do and the opportunity to be at the company but it's really hard to to leave because you are you are looked after and you're secured with that salary you're used to mm. with all the pay and benefits and conditions and, and wonderful parts of being part of that company or many other major large corporations yeah but you are handcuffed yeah very carefully but that i'm proud to have, proud to wear them ab ab absolutely <laughs> you've got to go i'm going to pop these off now and uh <laughs> so there you are so so there you are i've, I've got a young family yeah. um and i had you know reached I think I'd achieved everything I wanted to achieve. And I remember yeah. the conversation with Jane one evening and she, she said to me, and I think it's almost word for word, she said, I think you've lost your mojo, haven't you? Ooh, because I'd, yeah. I'd lost my passion. I, I, there was, I was I, at Rolls-Royce, I'd started to go through the motions. Yeah. Um, it wasn't enough. And I Eat couldn't sleep, see work, how repeat. to, yeah. Eat, sleep, work, so I thought, I can't do this because this isn't, this isn't me. Um, so we'd saved a few thousand pounds up. Okay. And I mean a few thousand pounds. Um, and the decision was, and again, I, you know, you know, Jane has been an absolute rock through all of this. But she said to me, uh, I think a bottle of red wine was involved somewhere along the line. But she <laughs> said to me, do you think you can do this? And I said, yes. She says, well, I guess you better do it then. So mm. I resigned. 
brilliant. Um, That's a big leap of faith. Oh, it's scary. Absolutely scary. Um, and would I do it again? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, a good friend of mine at the time, who's moved to America now, but I remember sat in Costa's Coffee with him. And he said to me, I know exactly what you're doing here. And he says, you're trying to work out how big does that war chest need to be for you to leave? Mm. I said, you're dead right. He said, well, I'm telling you now, you'll never know how big it needs to be. Because you'll keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger and it will it will start to become a blocker. He said, if you've already made up your mind, then do it. And that was one of those, again, with all these other bits of data I was getting that just said, just jump. <laughs> just jump. You know, jump so and the exciting. safety net will appear. Yeah. Um, and I've always, I've always done everything to the best of my ability. That's always what I've done. And that is the thing which has been my best investment. And now we can tie into thinking it better. Because if you take, take those three words hmm. to think it better, hmm. you couldn't possibly leave your comfort zone if you're not prepared to think it better no. to then evolve. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you'd, you'd be defeating the point of this business. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and I do. And it was one of those things... The name was invented by uh, another friend and colleague of mine at the time now, a guy called Alan Ross. And Alan and I sat in a motorway service station near Castle Donington, um, you know, and we were both, you know, thinking of what was next in life. Um, and that is where, over a Costa's coffee, the name was born. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got the name and that often gives us a title and a sense of identity of yes. what this is and what yes. you now represent. Yes. And so what did that, what is thinking it better? So thinking it better for me was almost taking everything that Ian had learnt okay. from being that picked on kid at school and realising that the thing that got in my way and stopped me doing stuff that I maybe really, really wanted to do was what I was thinking. Okay. And I was putting all this stuff in my way. And I knew that if I thought about it in a in a better way, then better things would happen. <laughs> yeah. Which sounds so blindingly obvious, almost to the point where people say, oh, you just, you just, um, what did my mum call it that I did once? She says, oh, well, what is it you do? My mum is 90 now. And I, I you know, I've, I try to explain, you know, what, what I do. She said, so are you, are you a mind bender? And I kind of, you know, no, not you, I laughed no. a bit and I thought, no, but I kind of get, am I, am I, am I using the plasticity of the brain? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, so that is what thinking it better was all about. Now my, all I was doing at the time when I first started the business is my, a large amount of my life I've spent in, in whatever job I'm doing is, is running big projects. Mm. Um, so, you know, doing something new that hasn't been done before with a group of people and resources. Um, and that's what I'd kind of done all the way along. And I realized that if we changed the way we thought about that, that job got easier. Yeah. You know, if we were consistently sat around a table saying, oh, this is really hard. We're never going to find a way to do this. This is never going to come in on time. A, it was really challenging. It wasn't very exciting. It was quite depressing. And lo and behold, you never delivered anything on time. Whereas if you dared to believe that you might bring it in on time, then people started to smile a little bit more, have a little bit more confidence and a little bit more energy and actually more good stuff than bad stuff started to happen. Mm -hmm. So thinking it better was initially about thinking projects better. Okay. Um, and our very early strat line was um, personal and project goals, achieving your personal and project goals. That was our strat line at the time. So although the company has changed, you know, we've evolved because as it went beyond just me, I realized that we could do not just project stuff, but we could get into operations management. We could get into setting company strategy because I've got, you know, people around me now who, who work with me, um, who have got those specializations, but all, all believe in the church of thinking it better in that the fundamentally it's it's the why and the, the thought process that makes the difference. So so thinking it better has now become um, known for helping either an individual or a team or a company change and grow its ability 
by changing the way it thinks and the way a business thinks is ergo its culture so by by helping people shape the way they think what we're doing is we're indirectly shaping the culture of that team of that business um, and then better things happen absolutely and that's really what it what it's all about whatever it is whatever your it is you know if it's so i've worked with a number of racing drivers thinking thinking driving a car better um work with people who own businesses you know thinking running my business better people managing projects thinking my project better it doesn't really matter what what the it is the process around it is the same you, you sprinkle in some specializations and i would i'd call upon people to do that but yeah, I, I think the value that I, I try to bring is I think I'm pretty good now at seeing the wood for the trees. I can pretty much get to the point and say, yeah, no, 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 this is the issue. This is the thing you need to fix. And then we just apply what we know to do that. That's interesting. I was about to conclude on what <laughs> <laughs> on there, but uh, I would find it um, telling someone what the issue is often isn't the solution, though. No. You have to let them, you have to help them find out what that is you know teach a man to fish versus <laughs> well the interesting and it's an interesting thing and and i don't know whether it's an age thing or an experience thing but i'm fairly comfortable pointing out to people where i think the issue lies okay um and you know we we've done that uh I, i've walked away from some business opportunities as a result of that okay where i don't think i think they're kidding themselves because um people have got to want to yes okay you know people will say to, oh yeah, yeah that you know that positive mental attitude stuff doesn't work well no it won't if you don't want it to <laughs> you're not going to think it <laughs> i'll think it worse yeah i think i'll think it average <laughs> <laughs> um now you know and again it's important to say that the whole field of human performance and mental health and mental well-being i'm not as naive to say that just change the way you think and it'll all be better yeah, yeah. it's it is one of you know we're complicated creatures mm -hmm. you know so we need to look after our sleep what we put in our bodies our physical fitness we, we you know we've got to do that but by the way to make a significant change then the way we talk to ourselves is is huge yeah. Um, and that's that's what it's all about for me. And if there's someone who doesn't want to change, great. I'm happy. I'm happy that you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> but if there's someone who wants to change, but at the minute believes they can't, then come and have a conversation. Yeah, because the, the powerful drive is the want and the why. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Do you offer, is it kind of a commercial packages? Do you go into companies for like a week or a few days? So um, the general process that, that we've adopted, whether it's an individual or whether it's a company or a team, um, it's to understand, it's to structure and evolve. Um, now, let's try, try and de, um, sort of um, interpret those words, understand so what we would never do is to go into a team, an individual a business, and say, oh, what you need is some NLP or what you need is some positive mental attitude. So NLP is Neuro Linguistic, linguistic programming. programming. So there's lots of stuff. Let's, so you know, there's, there's so much stuff in this space. There's Neuro Linguistic Programming. There's um, positive psychology. There's mindfulness. There's meditation. There's mm. life coaching. There's, there's so many things that people will try and pigeonhole. That, oh, that's the way you change your thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and really the, the, the thing I'm saying is that the reason to understand is the important first step is before trying to push any process technique or treatment upon any individual team or business you need to first of all understand what it is that they're trying to do mm. gk chesterton i think famously said uh, it's not that they don't understand the solution it's they don't understand the problem yeah. so first of all it you know it's if it's an individual you know what are you trying to do i want to want to i want to win a race Okay, why? And let's spend some time finding out why, did, why is it important to you to win that race? Because for most people, it's not about holding the trophy above the head. Hmm. <laughs> it's about something else. And it's the something else which is the why, not the trophy above the head. And when I go into a business, oh, we want to train all our leaders in, in this. Okay, help me understand why that is. 
well because they're not doing their job okay so tell me why that is so you know so again so this understand piece is really important you know where individual team or business let's at least have a conversation and that will involve two or three visits you know some conversations to say look what are you trying to achieve and at that point i have a professional responsibility here particularly with an individual is if i think that what they are looking for um is beyond what I can offer. In other words, if they are in the realms of needing some counselling or professional help, then it, I have a responsibility to say, well, actually, I'm not the person to this, but I would signpost you to, to somewhere okay. else. So, uh, and if it's a business, I need to make sure that they're really up for it. And if it's a team, that, that what they're after is um, is legal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so that whole understand phase is really for both of us to understand yeah. What are you looking for and do I think I can help? Yeah. So understand, structure. The next piece is an individual or a business. So with an individual, typically um, it would be a program of uh, interactions. Um, typically we start with a behavioural profile mm -hmm. um, such that we can help people become self-aware and it helps us inform how they are most likely to want to be helped we're all different. Mm. Um, so to understand um, how that person's uh, character is and how they are most likely to want to be dealt with is important. Then we would go into a series of, I mean, whether it be coaching, mentoring, teaching, combination thereof, um, a series of regular weekly, monthly, biweekly, whatever suits the pace of what they're trying to achieve. And some of it will be educating them about, look, this is how the brain works and this is how what's going on here. And then we'll work with them to say, so how do we think you can adapt that for you? So we kind of flip between educate, coach, mentor, teach. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so program a work. So typically with an individual, um, you know, it will be an initial session and a series of four, five, six structured sessions um, to get them underway. With a business, um, not dissimilar, we would maybe start with individuals, but then we would spend some time on site with the business and we would ask some questions. We'd, we'd walk around. We want to, you know, open a few cupboard doors metaphorically and ask lots of people the same question and try and build up a view of what's actually happening in the business. Um, so examples where we've been asked to go in, we want you to teach all our uh, middle managers how to manage. Hmm. Um, you know, the result was um, the issue here is the senior leadership team isn't structured yeah. the way it needs to be so we need to start here and whilst that was an uncomfortable truth for them to maybe uh hear you know we ended up working with that business for over three years um so that's the approach um so yeah sometimes it's as straightforward as and people can you know can have from us a a, a personal package um or they can you know we can come and work with them but we we like to go through that process um yeah i i'm we're not a a chalk and talk training company okay. we're a business who likes to help people make a sustained change and that's why it's worth investing in it and i suppose you've seen a little window of that because obviously yes. when you were in expecting to be in a chalk and talk session i was yes but we lifted the lid on some other interesting stuff some human behaviors a little bit of enlightenment of, yeah. well, this is why i believe like this and uh yeah you can definitely go into those programs thinking it worse yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just have to survive these two days and actually yeah. I've left with a, a better a better feel for why I want it to succeed yeah. and believing it so. And go on, for, for me, it, it's about, and, and it's not meant to sound corny because it's something that does drive me, but I think if everyone every day changed one thing they thought about for the better, the net result would be the world would become a better place. Now... The number of people I can influence in a lifetime is is finite. Mm. That's why I do the podcast. Yes, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, it's just about just just you know try it for today. You know, even if you don't believe this stuff, just why don't you just today just, just try try, try yeah. this, and you might just be surprised. So one of the ways you've uh, tried to influence others and in, uh, is through motorsport. Mm. So you described before we chatted about this that you're not a particular like motorsport advocate, but you have found some considerable success in thinking it better through the medium of a race and yes. working with 
both race drivers, mm. um, racing drivers, and uh, I guess there's definitely benefits from a motorbike point of view, and that's why yeah. I, <laughs> I'm also curious about yeah. it. So why the motorsport connection? It was completely by fluke, if I'm completely honest with you. Um, the first person I worked with in motorsport, uh, he's a guy um, who uh, who owns uh, a couple of businesses and he used to race um, in British GT. Mm. The podcast episode, if you look at Richard Marsh. Um, Richard Marsh. So I met Rich. Rich was looking for some... Um, for some for some guidance some help um so we spent quite a lot of time um, working together probably over a period of a year um and i helped him structure his thoughts that that's basically what i do i, I help rich get out of his own way um and as a result of that it, it it didn't just make the racing better um but it made lots of things better um and for me that's what it what it's all about is is just helping people structure their thoughts get get interested about why they're having the thoughts get interested about how the brain works and the impact of those thoughts i'm an engineer by background and now that i understand when i have a thought what it does in my head and that it connects things with neurons and synapses and chemicals and electric charges it's actually engineering it's wiring mm. and knowing that and realizing that by changing the way i think i can change that wiring that's hugely powerful um so it was a complete fluke that i ended up working with rich and he was he was um he was a racing driver um and other stuff as well so it just got me to realize that this stuff really does work in whatever arena now off the back of that I've then worked with a number of people um, in and around motorsport um, and, you know, a couple of other folk I've worked with as well in and around motorsport. I, I've got to mention um, Phil Waters, who runs the Calm All Porsche Trophy. Um, so that's a, a, a club racing type um, championship where they uh, bring a group of people together um, to race and have fun racing, but also create an environment where they can have conversations. Okay. Uh, and it supports the Campaign Against Living Miserably charity, Calm Against Male Suicide, um, which fits very, very well with my values. Mm. Um, so I'm delighted to work with a couple of drivers in that space too. Um, and I, I look forward to be able to maybe helping and supporting Phil over the over the next sort of um, year or so. Um, so for me, it's not the motorsport itself that is the fascination. It's yet again realising that you've got this microcosm of if I change this thought from A to B, the result moves from A to B. Yeah. And there are other things at play as well. You can't just, I'm just going to believe I'm going to win there if I'm going to win. There's a lot of other things that have got to stack up. But all of those things stack up if the thinking and belief and focus is in the right place a pit crew that thinks more positively and works better together will deliver a better result for the driver. Absolutely. Because um, you're operating as one team. As one team. And the thing that I, I kind of connect with from a motorsport mental attitude point of view is that basically motorsport is just riding around a circle or racing <laughs> around a circle. Yes. It, it, most of it boils down to yeah. a set perimeter of which mm. you try and drive that, the, the kind of wiggly circle as fast as possible yep. and in a, in a sense it's uh, pretty ridiculous <laughs> whether you do it for 24 hours or yep. you do it for 10 minutes yeah. <laughs> there's a joy or even a few seconds uh, or if you go to do flat track scenarios but um, there's a one of the joys of it is the fact that it's a very objective measure of success and perceived failure yes. because how quickly you ran, drive around the circle versus your peers is therefore the measure of you winning or losing. Yep. And so you can objectively measure performance and success through that, whereas yes. often life and its challenges are more subjective. Yeah, um, this is this is true. So it is that that's why I think it's it's quite a fascinating place to operate, you know, in in sport or in arenas, even in operational arenas where you know if I can change the way that team thinks, if, let's take the sales team. If mm. we can change the way a sales team interacts with customers potential and changes the way they think you can actually watch the dial then move on yes. um, on sales 
Um, and this isn't about sales closing technique or anything like that. It's about people. It's about relationships. It's about how you treat other people. And if you change that, you can see a result. Um, and that's the thing that really fascinates me. It's how how you can see the way that we think playing out. Um, and you'll know this. You know, if you if you're out, you know, and you're on a race circuit or you're out running or whatever it is you're doing. I mean, running for me, I, I, I love my running and I spent a lot of time coaching people getting into running um, beginner runners. If they've got in their mind that they hate hills, <laughs> yeah. then your body is going to do some brilliant stuff for you because it's saying, right, I'm going to keep you safe. So all those sensors, all that sensory input that we're getting all the time, which our body's filtering out because it's not important. If you believe you don't do hills, and you start to run up a hill, all those sensors in your legs that yeah. would start to give you pain are going to start saying, I think this signal's useful to you. Yeah. You know, well, you're right, this hurts. Slow down. And then you close the circle. There you go. Told you I was rubbish at hills. Yeah. And we're, and we're, you know, the brain's happy. Whereas if you dare to, yeah, um, let's con your brain. Um, let's get it off thinking about the hill and let's get it on to thinking about what a great view it's going to be at the top yeah. and suddenly your body lets you get to the top and and that's kind of it and people say oh yeah but you're just tricking your brain uh yeah yeah <laughs> it's yours to trick <laughs> it's yours to trick <laughs> um that's really why are those synapses <laughs> yeah yeah because you know i guess the headline here is your brain tricks you most of the time mm. most of us most of the time if you think about what you're thinking about you're usually winding yourself into the future and thinking about all those things that might happen, good or bad, or you're thinking about all those things you wish had happened differently, good good or bad, and all of your chatter in your head is going on. So you're, you're telling your brain those stories, and it's those stories that are then starting to influence your behaviour, which is why, and I do it myself, you know, I am the world's worst warrior when it comes to ridiculous things. So your brain starts to tell you stories about all the worst possible outcomes. And what happens? They never happen. Yes, but it can also be a protection mechanism. Yes. So we are conditioned to keep ourselves safe. So the, but the, I guess the point here is, is just to recognise, is that a helpful thought to me? Mm -hmm. Or am I actually being subject to a story which is really unhelpful to me? Um, and that is part of... What we do you know is how do you separate yourself from those thoughts and so the one thought at a time podcast mm. became has become an avenue since february 22 yes 50th episode this yes today Ta -da. um <laughs> and you've you've interviewed uh and well 49 yes <laughs> <laughs> 49 people to, and and how have you found it exploring their journeys and kind of connecting it with the one thought at a time and i guess what is one thought at a time? Right. Why so, are we going there? Right. So let, let's <laughs> so let, let let's switch into that. So one thought at a time for me uh, is I have um, my oldest son Charlie and my friend and colleague uh, Jason in America to thank for this because they were both saying to me probably three years ago, "You should have a podcast. We think you got something. You know, you got you got something that people should hear." Um, and eventually. Yeah, I, I, I did it. And, you know, we are where we are. It, it's, it is separate from the business and it really is uh, an avenue to have those conversations with people. Because going back to what we've been speaking about all the way through this, mm -hmm. it's about recognising you can swim against the flow. And I'm, I've been fascinated with all 49 conversations and all 49 different guests have different stories that even I learn from. And it's daring to... Daring to be you, daring to get out of your own way, daring to try something which isn't the main flow. And that's what spurs me on, you know. And so you know, if it changes one person, one thought at a time, then I'm, I'm happy. Okay, so that's why, that's that's the mission. That's the mission. That is the mission. <laughs> so there are a couple of questions that um, uh, we, that you subject, <laughs> that you offer the opportunity <laughs> for your guests to answer. Okay. And one of those questions is about the, the miracle of time travel. Okay. <laughs> so, Ian, if you could conquer time travel and you could leave the younger version of you a note, so knowing what you know now, mm. what would you put in it? 
it's interesting this because obviously I've, I've I've known this question's coming and I've thought about it quite a lot and it hasn't been an easy one but I think I would write something like this it's okay to be different um it's okay to be different the younger me because I wasn't the popular kid and I wasn't in with everything else and I didn't follow football and never have uh, and I kind of fell into university I it, I always felt conscious that I wasn't normal if that sounds strange and and that impacted a lot of my early life early career um, even to the point when I went for uh, my introduction day at Rolls Royce and was 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 criticised by a senior leader who was welcoming all the graduates because I was wearing a tie that was different from everyone else's. <laughs> um, so I think the letter to my younger self would be, it's okay to be and think differently. Just be you. Um, but there was no one around at the time who got that uh, and I'm you know eternally grateful to my parents because they they supported whatever I chose to do um, but maybe the choices I was making at the time I was even putting limits on that so I yeah my letter to my younger self would be it's okay to, to be different and just be you I think younger Ian would have appreciated that <laughs> he might have listened <laughs> And so I do have the second question to ask you mm. <laughs> um, because you give uh, the opportunity for previous guests to leave a question for like the next guest. Mm. And as a previous guest, uh, the question that I would like to ask you is mm. um, when was the last time you experienced absolutely delirious joy in the moment of doing something? It's an excellent question. I'm always a believer is that the first thoughts that come to your mind Absolutely. are usually the ones. So I am I am going to go to the most recent, which is probably January 2023. Okay. Uh, we went on holiday as a family. Um, so that was uh, Jane, I, Oliver, Charlie and Hannah. And we all went to Iceland. OK. And there were probably a couple of moments in there where we were amongst the most amazing snowy landscapes, seeing the most amazing glaciers and waterfalls that I found that there are moments in there which were an intense emotional experience. Um, now it wasn't maybe necessarily which something which I I articulated very much other than maybe a smile on my face but that sensation of it, for me it was a mix of everything it was being with people that you know and love in doing something which is outdoors and different and amazing and feeling how wonderful this world is that we live in all of that stuff all together in one place um, was special more of those please <laughs> <laughs> exactly and i think as something that we can all kind of take from this conversation is what's that flashbulb memory of that absolute highlight of glorious endorphins and emotions yes almost in a state of what you're grateful for in the moment mm. rather than um inducing something yeah agreed yeah lots more of those lots more of those and so the final conclusion is what next What's the future of One Thought at a Time? Or uh, just life in general, Ian? What's, what are um, you thinking about? I need to continue to take my own medicine. Okay. COVID was a time when I had to really rely on what I know and rely on the people around me who I could, um, who, I, who I love and trust. Um, the last couple of years, um, you know, we've had some interesting challenges with the business uh, and again I would I'd go to the same uh, you know remind myself why I do this 
uh, and that it's supposed to be something that I enjoy. Um, so again, to listen to myself and to those who I love and trust. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that because life's a learning journey. Absolutely. Um, what next? Uh, I look forward to meeting some just more amazing people. And my focus is going to be spending time working with and being around people that I enjoy spending time with and working with and that's a choice thank you very much Ian so <laughs> that was one thought at a time with our guest Ian Travers and if you have been thank you very much for listening Ooh.